And now that we have our app configured, it's time to start pushing and pulling data. So let's go through the next series of steps. We've got our database that's been generated in the server, and we're going to now try and connect in. And when an Azure service exposes a table for a mobile client, it does it by opening an endpoint on the server using the slash tables prefix with the name of the table that it's interested in. And the mobile client sends standard HTTP requests to the server, which then turns those into database queries based on the HTTP verb. And the server identifies the operation being performed based on that verb, and then it issues an asynchronous operation to the database against the table identified by the endpoint. The database then returns a set of rows or a row count based on the operation, and the server will then translate the resulting data into a JSON response and then send it back to the client. And every operation you do against the table results in a network flow that's very similar to this. So let's look at how we issue these calls in code. To access an exposed table from your Azure service, you'll need to use an iMobile service table interface. And this represents a single table endpoint and has all the methods on it to read and write to the table. And as with a mobile service client, you generally will get the table interface and cache it off in your app to access the table data. You get this interface through your mobile service client object and the getTable method. So you have to supply the table name, which is appended to the URL endpoint to identify the specific table to work with. You can then execute methods on this table to get, insert, update, and delete data from the server-side database table it represents. So here, for example, we are retrieving all the records with a built-in method named readAsync, walking through all the return records and accessing an ID property on each one. So notice, just like before, we're using the dynamic keyword to get the ID value. And this type being used here is a J object, which represents a JSON data blob. The ID property that we're accessing on these records is a standard part of the table structure returned by every Azure App Service mobile app table. And it represents a primary key on the table and is by default a string type. And there's four other values you can expect to see for every table as well. And these values are used for synchronization with the server. There's the created at, updated at, version, and deleted. Now created at represents the date and time the record was created. Updated at represents the date and time the record was last updated. The version represents a base64 encoded string that represents a unique version. And deleted, well, it's a boolean that represents that the record has been deleted. The deleted and the version are actually used to support offline synchronization. So these columns are server generated and populated by default. Clients can access this data, but really you should consider them to be read only. The dynamic support in C-sharp is very convenient, and especially if you don't know exactly what the shape of the JSON data is, it can actually be a quick and easy way to work with that data. However, it does have a runtime cost both in performance and memory because it relies on runtime interrogation of the object in order to retrieve the data. Now, it also lacks IntelliSense, which makes it easy to accidentally misspell a property value and cause a runtime failure. Now, instead, and like most developers, we prefer to work with strongly typed data. And if you know exactly what you're working with and know what fields you want to use in your client application, then you can create a data transfer object, also known as a DTO, to represent the data. And this is where we define a .NET object that conforms to the shape of the JSON and has public properties that match up to the expected fields in the JSON object. And we can then use a JSON parcel like the newtonsoft.json library to convert our object to and from JSON. But it turns out that the mobile service client has this support built in. GetTable has a generic version which takes the defined DTO to work with. And under the covers, the methods will now use the Newtonsoft json.net parser to turn the JSON data into the specified DTO type. And this allows us to work completely with strongly typed data. And notice that it now returns a collection of our DTO objects and that we get full IntelliSense when we interact with the data. Now, using this variation is preferred over working with raw JSON types if possible because it enforces the expected data between the client and server and reduces the risk of runtime exceptions due to missing or misspelled data. So let's actually talk a little bit about defining a DTO. The one property you absolutely must define in every DTO is the ID property. And this is the primary key on the table and it's used in almost every operation to identify the record that we're working with. For example, when you update the record, the ID property is used in the server-side WHERE clause to identify the record being updated. 
As mentioned earlier, the server will populate this field even for insertions. But from the client side, we should consider this really to be a read-only value. The JSON.NET parser by default will match properties in the DTO to values in the JSON using the property names. And it ignores cases for these matches too. And that means you shouldn't have two properties with the same name that differ only in case. Here we defined a new property named text and that'll be matched to a text value in the JSON data structure. You'll notice in the JSON data structure, text is actually all lowercase. And if the value doesn't exist in the JSON object, then it'll be ignored and left in a default state, which will be null. If you want to change the name of the DTO property to something more relevant to your client side code, you can apply a JSON property attribute to the property and specify a different name. And this is used for both serialization as well as deserialization. Here we're using the attribute from the newtonsoft.json framework because that's the parser the Azure SDK uses. However, the parser also knows about the system.runtime.serialization attributes used by the data contract framework that was introduced in WCF. So if you already use these attributes, then the parser will respect those values. And for example, here we could use a data member attribute to change the name of the serialized property. As shown earlier, you can access the other built-in columns if desired by declaring fields in your object to capture those values. And this is completely optional, and if you don't use these fields, then you don't need the properties. And the same name matching technique is used, it's just a JSON value after all. However, you can also apply some other built-in attributes to ensure the name is matched properly. So it matches up version, the created, and updated dates. So these are just custom versions of the JSON object attribute that we saw with the name pre-populated. And it's useful to use these if you want the system supplied fields, just in case they ever change the default name of the field. And keep in mind that this only matches up to the default name. If the server changes, then these attributes won't apply. Remember that these values are really intended to be populated by the server side. You generally should really avoid changing them, but they must have a public setter so the parser can set them. If you want to define client-side properties on your DTO which shouldn't be sent to the server, then you should decorate these properties with a JSON ignore attribute. And this is useful for client-side values that are created and used only by the client-side. For example, here we've got a title, which might be the first 10 characters of the entry, or you might have a property that concatenates two other properties from your DTO. Now when this attribute is present, the parser will skip over the property. Even if the value is present in the JSON data, it won't be filled in. This attribute is particularly important when sending a DTO up to the server, since it will by default serialize all public properties into the JSON blob. One interesting thing to notice when getting the table interface using a strongly typed DTO is we don't supply a table name like we did with the non-generic version. Now instead, the table is identified using the name of the DTO itself. And here we would issue calls to the tables slash diary entry endpoint. And the URLs are case insensitive, so this would match slash tables slash lowercase dire entry. However, we often want to name our DTO using .NET conventions, and our tables are often defined in SQL terms, which don't always line up. For example, what if we named our server-side table entries? If we issue this request, we'll get a 404, or not found error, because there's no diary entry table exposed. We can break this relationship the same way we customize the property names through an attribute. And in this case, it's the JSON object or data contract attribute. So we specify the specific table endpoint name as part of the attribute and it'll change the URL. Finally, one other customization point is the parser itself. And when you create the mobile service client, you can set some additional properties on it. One of the most common is the serializer settings property. And this allows you to customize how the JSON parser works with the data being sent or received from the service. For example, you can change how casing is handled, how dates are handled, or how missing fields in the data are also processed.